Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm Ashley. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ventana. We are a 3D commerce platform uh, that makes it really easy to take existing manufacturing design files and instantly use them for web, social, and game engines uh, through our cloud content management system that has patented optimization that does the work no one likes doing anyways. Um, and I'm here with Safir uh, from VF, one of our clients. Hey, everyone. My name is Safir. Um, I, for those who don't know VF Corporation, um, it's a portfolio of brands, Vans, North Face, Timberland, Dickies, Supreme, plus another seven, seven brands in a, a fashion footwear and uh, accessories space. Um, and I lead the advanced digital creation team. Um, and we're, we're supporting our brands with a digital transformation of their go-to-market process. Yeah, um, thanks so much for being here. So super excited to dig into um, everything Safir has led at VF Corp. Uh, I figured we'd start with kind of just an overview of all the amazing ways that 3D can be used across uh, the retail value chain. Um, it's really driving huge efficiency and in increasing sales across organizations. Um, so many apparel, Companies are starting to design and clo and browseware in 3D, footwares, Modo, Keyshot. Everyone kind of has their tool of choice. Um, but this is providing just better uh, blueprints for manufacturers. Um, it also speeds up the design process, so you can, you can have a quicker iteration. Um, we're also seeing clients fully replace physical samples. Um, so we have a client that does children's clothing. Um, with COVID, they were kind of forced to try this, and they're never going back, because um, they saved about $100,000 per collection by not manufacturing the physical samples, using 3D instead, increased their speed to market, um, and they saved 4.4 tons of carbon by not manufacturing those samples, which is huge. And that's also a real cost in Europe where you have to pay for, for carbon credits. Um, so happy that COVID kind of forced people to try it and, and they're really not, not going back. Um, and then of course, there's all the consumer facing experiences. So we've seen 3D increase conversion rate, increase average cart size and reduce returns. Um, these are you know the Shopify general stats that they came uh, you know, across all their different merchants. We've had clients like Diesel do 3D where conversion rates stayed the same, but they saw ACV increase 70% with 3D and 2D. Um, so there, there's just huge value there. And then Facebook and Instagram are starting to experiment with 3D and AR ads. So, you know, they released Spark AR a while ago where you can create custom experiences, um, but they actually gave us early access to their ad API, and we've been able to fully automate the creation of 3D and AR ads. So this isn't fully available yet. Um, they're testing it with certain brands, so you may or may not see this on your newsfeed, but it's as easy as uploading a design file to Ventana. Uh, you can choose the Facebook settings, so it'll make sure it's under 100,000 polys, 1K textures, everything else you need. You can just hit publish to meta catalog. So then a social media manager can create a 3D AR ad the way they create a 2D ad today. Um, and that's what I'm super excited about, making this super easy for people um, to use and do. Because we don't we know there's not enough developers or 3D artists. Um, and then of course Snapchat, which is the furthest along in clothing try-on, they've also consistently seen double conversion rates using 3D and AR. <coughs> And Google, um, so they finally made their announcement last week um, that they really believe AR will be the next paradigm shift of shopping. Um, so they made this announcement last week uh, and you actually can now surface 3D models in Google search. So we're helping our clients who use our viewer on e so that Google can actually see it for SEO and then it can also now start showing up in ads, which is super exciting. And then there's digital influencers or VTubers. You need 3D assets if you want to dress these people because they're not real. <laughs> um, and they are just continuing to gain in popularity. Um, DressX is even selling digital only fashion. So, you know, those past two years have proven people are willing to spend money on digital only goods especially to dress their avatars. Uh, so super excited about the announcement Epic made the other week, opening up Fortnite, making it easier 
to bring in and sell digital assets um, versus it being closed off. So it's a whole new revenue stream for, for fashion. And NFTs are, are really changing the game. So, you know, I know there's a lot of hype around NFTs and now they're crashing. I think that correction was needed, but they really provide the, the contract of ownership for digital goods. Um, and so if I buy that Gucci bag in Roblox, I could take it into Fortnite because I own that and that contract tells me that. Um, so yeah, in its summary, you know, 3D is really benefiting the entire life cycle from design and manufacturing, sales and marketing, and opening up whole new revenue streams. So, how do you get started? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Safir. Um, so how did you guys start your 3D journey at VF Corp? Um, and, you know, what are some tips and lessons learned? And I'll give it to you. <laughs> yeah, there have been many. Um, so the, the 3D journey at, at VF is an interesting one. Um, when I joined Vans back in 20, uh, 2004, so it's been 18 years, uh, I came from, from the automotive world. And um, in the automotive um, design process, you have to go through, you have to use 3D, um, you know, because the, um, the prototyping, uh, the cost of prototyping are so, are so high, um, and the, the 3D files that you end up building actually are used in the manufacturing process. So it's a natural, it's a natural extension of that, that, that process. Um, so I brought with me a number of um, workflows and, and processes that I had, I had kind of developed in the automotive world. And when I joined, um, I wasn't designing shoes. I was designing action sports equipment. So, um, you know, injection molded products, body armor, helmets, technical footwear and things like that. And I slowly started um, kind of introducing these new visualization processes and starting to introduce, um, you know, rendering, um, you know, 3D modeling and, and things like that. Um, and after, after a certain point, it became obvious that a brand like Vans was the perfect candidate within the, the VF portfolio of, of brands to experiment with um, what we call virtualization at this point. So we ended up scanning our um, top five uh, um, styles, you know, the, the classic uh, silhouettes. Uh, which together drive about 60% of the, the, the sales. Um, and then the rest was really about materializing. So it, you know, it, it made a lot of sense to do that. And we did that, um, it took a few years. It, we started, I think, in 2010, 2011. Um, and uh, you know, we're, at that point, we were partnering with, uh, with technology partners, uh, experimenting with real-time visualization, things like that. Um, and uh, you know, by, by learning, testing, experimenting, and then expanding from pilots, from proof of concepts to pilots to implementation, um, we're able to carry that, um, you know, those learnings to other brands, to other categories, and then to other brands within the, the, the portfolio of, of, uh, of brands. Um, so we officially, you know, kicked off a, an enterprise-wide um, digital product creation initiative in 2017, and um, right now, you know, m my role is, is part of a, a much bigger group that is um, focused on the digital transformation of the, of the, the go-to-market process. Um, and uh, we're supporting the big four brands uh, and then also, you know, helping the emerging brands, uh, as we call them, um, you know, get on the, the, the DPC wagon. Got it. And so that, that it sounds like... A starting with a brand, one brand that's smaller, that could be more nimble, was kind of the way to go, um, and then it kind of expand from there. What were, what were some of the obstacles for adoption, um, you know, across the different brands? Or, and, and how do you kind of suggest, if, if people here are trying to implement 3D at their companies, you know, lessons learned? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the first and biggest lesson was that people actually have a job to do. You know, it's not like they're sitting there waiting to do things differently. They have a job to do. They have to deliver products season after season. They don't have time to learn new tools, new processes, you know, as, as cool as they may sound. Um, so for us, it was really, really challenging to be able to find that 
you know, f to find the champions, first of all, that uh, had the understanding, the vision, but also the, the time to take this on and kind of experiment. That was probably the biggest one. Um, then we, we were pretty ambitious, and we, we put together some, some targets that were very, very ambitious, you know, which is good, but we learned that this takes time. You know, and um, I think understanding the importance of change management uh, is critical. It's not, it's not just about the tools. It's not about the technologies. It's not even about time. It's about understanding how to drive a um, pretty major transformation through an organization that's been used to doing things a certain way, right? Um, and the last thing is for us understanding the importance of the, um, the human component of this transformation, right? It, um, you know, again, it's, the technology is one thing, but you, you need to be able to relate to the people you're asking to change the way they do things. Um, why this is important, you know, and, and really understanding um, how to, you know, there's an element of psychology, there's an element of, you know, um, motivation, but also inspiration. And, um, and, you know, what we learned is that it's really a combination of a mandate and a movement, right? The mandate by itself, you know, will get things done, but if the people are not really bought into, um, into the idea, into the vision, nothing's gonna happen. If it's just a, a, a movement, you'll, you'll have, you know, a bunch of really passionate individuals that are trying to drive change, but without the support from the leadership, you won't go anywhere. So it's really a combination of those two that, that we felt, um, you know, was, uh, was going to, to yield uh, the biggest results. For sure, because I mean, so many people who've maybe been at VF Corp for years um, or any other brand, we're asking them to learn brand new tools and invest time in that, um, which is huge. Yeah. Um, so now that you guys, you know, it's like a few years since 2011, that's like crazy. Um, over, you know, over the past 10 years, decade, um, what are some of the, the biggest benefits you've seen or some of the most exciting projects? So I would say the, the clearest and the biggest benefit that we're able to, to highlight uh, happened just a, a couple of years ago. You know, when the pandemic hit, um, and this is a, you know, this is a challenge that most of us, I think, went through. Um, all of a sudden, our, our teams did not have access to samples and did not have access to showrooms. So what do you do, right? Um, so what we ended up, and, and what was great is that we had set things in motion and we were ready. We were ready, we had a process that uh, had allowed us to digitize a large portion of the season line. Um, we just had to, uh, to crank that up. And we were able to very quickly, within, um, you know, within a couple of months, to completely um, virtualize. Uh, this was in fall 21, this was for fall 21. Um, so, um, uh, allowed us to, to completely um, digitize the B2B selling process, create virtual showrooms, um, and allow our, our sales teams to sell product completely virtually um, in, you know, in, a, in a record amount of time. So had we not initiated uh, that, that, that process earlier, earlier, you know, a few years ago, um, we would have had a few seasons of really challenging, you know, interactions. And, yeah, I mean, there was just no option. And sometimes there's still, today, logistics are still yeah. a problem. Yeah. Um, and what were some of the tools that, that helped you all do that quickly to create, you know, the, the virtual, I mean, obviously Ventana, but besides us? <laughs> um, so for us, it was, you know, the, the biggest component of, of that process was asset creation. So creating assets for, um, you know, but, asset creation across multiple categories because you know at a certain point our brands have multiple categories sell create develop and and sell multiple categories so um, we had to really streamline the processes of creating footwear assets apparel assets and even accessories um, and then we had to find a way to properly visualize them because ultimately 
um, you want your audience to feel comfortable making important decisions based on something that doesn't exist physically, right? So it has to be true digital twin. It has to be a, um, a, a high fidelity representation of, of the physical product. So um, once, once we were able to, um, to create those assets, the next challenge was um, to make them deploy them on a platform that was easily accessible, that was intuitive. Um, we ended up uh, experimenting with with a number of them, and, and we're still, you know, transitioning. This is this, you know, this has been a, a big um, learning uh, opportunity for us. You know, real-time visualization, whether it is web-based or um, game engine-based, you know, um, is uh, is really important because. Um, it ensures that the assets that you've created, that you've spent so much time uh, creating, are accessible, they're visible, they, um, they show up the way they should show up. Um, and ultimately, you know, are a good representation of the, the physical, physical product. Um, so I'd say we've, we've tried everything out there. And, you know, my previous role was, in, in, uh, was leading innovation, digital innovation for, uh, for VF. Um, and then during those three, four years, I had done all the work already. You know, I had experimented and I had, uh, you know, my team, it's obviously not just me, um, my team had, had really uh, um, developed an understanding of, of what was available, what was needed, and were able to quickly put that into practice, see what worked, what didn't, um, and, and get the work done. Yeah, that's great. And so we've kind of talked about from like the design perspective, speeding up iterations, the B2B sales. Um, what about the, the consumer journey? You know, what kind of, how do you see 3D transforming that um, consumer brand experience? And what are you most excited about? Yeah, I think the, the natural progression of this, once you've digitized your, your seasonal um, product lines, um, you know, the next question is, okay, what, what else can I do with this? You know, you can make internal decisions, uh, design decisions, uh, line architecture decisions. Um, you can, um, you know, you can create or you can use these digital assets to create visual assets for your websites, for B2B, um, you know, uh, platforms. Um, but then the, the question is, you have this amazing content. Right? How, how can you use that to really transform and elevate the, uh, the consumer experience? So, you know, thinking about um, creating diff new ways of visualizing the, the product, so using augmented reality, for instance. Virtual try-on, that's, that's a big one, right? Footwear, uh, I think the process is a little bit more mature than apparel, um, but we're getting there. So having the ability to not only represent how a garment looks on you, uh, but also how a certain size in that garment looks on you versus a different size. So that's, that's really important. But I would say, to, for me, the, the biggest promise of this is really the, the reinvention of the shopping, the shopping um, experience um, online, right? And also the ability to create um, really um, pretty powerful storytelling opportunities between your, your physical uh, retail experience and your 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 you know virtual retail experience. Um, I think there's a lot to be done, and and there's a lot of really interesting um, things to learn from that that process. Because you know, with uh, the um, the development of these new technologies, you have the ability to um, to get um, this much closer to um, a an intuitive. Um, highly visual, interactive shopping experience that you know you probably wouldn't even have in in a, in a physical environment. So this virtual shopping experience, I think, is uh, is for me the biggest promise. Yeah, agreed. I mean, you can show things that you couldn't show, you know, even just in the store. And once people are comfortable making a purchase from their home, you know, they're not going back as much, yeah. uh, right? And then on top of that, there was a study recently, you know, 43% of consumers do, uh, you know, research online and particularly in social media before making a purchase. So if you have the better, more immersive experience, chances are you're going to drive them into your store. So, you know, it's still an omni-channel conversation yeah, for sure. Um, 
And, uh, you know, what customer, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but like what customer experiences are you most excited about, whether it's VF or in general that you're seeing in 3D and immersive? I think, I mean, yeah, the virtual shopping experience is one of them. I think gaming um, is, is an extremely, you know, increasingly promising um, channel uh, because not only, you know, do you start thinking about shopping for yourself, your, your, your physical self, but now you have to start thinking about dressing and, and shopping for your, your many avatars, depending on, on what platform you're, you're in. So, um, you know, it's promising. Obviously, we, we talk a lot about interoperability. We talk about, you know, um, the, the, the ability to really um, use the same, the same assets uh, across, across multiple franchises, multiple platforms. We're not quite there yet, but you know, hopefully that, that'll happen soon. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, my, my friend's daughter asked for all her allowance in Robux, not in US dollars, right? She just wants to buy things for her avatar. So yep. like that, this generation is already very willing and able Probably, to yeah. purchase yeah, everything, which is exciting. Um, very cool, and that kind of leads me to, uh, you know, the M word, I guess some people hate it, but the metaverse, I mean, what's, what's your definition of that? How, how do you describe that? How do you see fashion, um, you know, in the metaverse and, and where do you see that going? Yeah, it's interesting because obviously, you know, it's a, it's a big topic these days. Um, if you think about this, this idea of physical versus virtual, right? There's only one physical um, reality. Right, although some people interpret yeah. <laughs> interpret the, the the physical reality in different ways, but um, you know, there's just one manifestation of your physical self and one manifestation of of the spaces that that you you inhabit. The metaverse, to me, is just a collection of these different manifestations. Right, it's a combination of environments, people, and activities. Uh, whether it's gaming, whether it's um, it's a virtual, you know, virtual store, whether it is um, a a social network that that um, allows you to to interact with people, it's you know the fundamental components is you know are always space, people, and and activity, and I think what I see is, you know, we're we're in the process of really seeing what resonates. With, uh, with the audience, what re resonates with the different generations, you know? An eight-year-old is gonna have a, a completely, I have nine-year-old twins, and they, they, they keep me honest, you know? They, they ask uh, questions that most of the time I have to think, uh, you know, uh, so, so I, can, I can give them a, a, pro uh, a proper answer. Um, but the experience of, of nine-year-olds is going to be very different than, than that of, of you know, Gen Xs or, or, or Gen Ys. So, um, so I think that's also the, the beauty of, of this opportunity we have in front of us. We can create the worlds that we want to live in, right? Anybody can, can and it's becoming more and more easy to do this. You can create the environments that you want to be um, you know, to interact with, with others, or you can decide to join one of the many that, that, that are available. Does it require new skills and new, um, a new understanding, a little bit of training? Of course, it's, it, that's always gonna be the case. Um, but I think, you know, for me, what's the most promising and inspiring in, in, in this idea is the fact that um, you are removing a lot of the constraints that you see in the physical, in the physical world, you know, cost, Physics, um, you know, uh, th there's there's a lot you can you can do that you can't do in the in the real world. Yeah, the van shoes can give me the ability to fly, and you know it, that's where I think it gets exciting. So, I think um, we might just be out of time. I don't know if we have time for one question, or if you guys have any. Awesome. Well, we have one minute to spare. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for sharing your experience. And, um, yeah, have fun at the rest of the conference. Thank you. All right, big hand for Ashley and Safir.